Well, good morning. And I'm actually going to ask the other the panelists to come up while I'm talking here, so we don't waste a lot of time later. Uh, so it's it's my job to set some of the context for the the distinguished panel that we have coming up here, and uh, I'm going to start by. You know, over the last several weeks, I've talked to a number of reporters from around the country, and almost everyone has asked me the same question. They say, look, we haven't really heard much about sequestration, and it's really hard to, to tell what's going on, and it doesn't really seem to be a problem. Why should we think it's a problem? Uh, and, you know, when I hear that again and again, I, I think this presents a real challenge to all of us. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, so what is sequestration and, and why is it so bad? Well, uh, here's just a, a few bullet points on this. Uh, first of all, sequestration in 2013 cuts more than $2 billion from HUD programs, really across the board cuts. Um, these cuts affect virtually every program uh, in, in the HUD portfolio except for those the hud VASH program, which serves uh, homeless veterans. Um, the most severe and immediate consequences of these cuts uh, will likely uh, take place in the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is the largest rental assistance program, and also the Homeless Assistance Grants programs this, uh, this year. Um, for instance, uh, we estimate that uh, because of sequestration alone, the voucher program will be serving up to 140,000 fewer families next year. Uh, that's a lot of rental assistance that's going out the door at a time when the need for assistance has is, is been climbing uh, dramatically. Um, in addition, there are severe shortfalls in funding for public housing operations and capital repairs, and I'm, I'm sure uh, our panelists are going to talk about that a good bit. Uh, HUD has already announced this year uh, uh, what amounts to a 25% reduction in funding for emergency solutions grants. Uh, those are grants that go to, to local homeless service providers. Uh, they fund emergency shelters. Uh, they fund homelessness prevention activities uh, to keep people out of shelters. Uh, they fund efforts to move people quickly uh, out of shelters and then into permanent housing. That's a 25% reduction. In addition, uh, it's likely that funding for the other half of, of the, the homeless assistance grant programs, the, the continuum of care grants, there will be deep shortfalls in those grants when they go out next year as well, uh, in the sense that there won't be enough money to fund all the renewals that are requested for existing homeless assistance uh, programs. So uh, that's uh, that's going to be a big problem. Uh, finally, I just want to point out that uh, sequestration is, is not a one-time thing. Uh, the fact is, if Congress does not change the law and undo sequestration, we are stuck with reduced funding for the next eight years as well. Uh, the cuts in the next eight years won't be across the board. Uh, sequestration in, in, in the remaining years acts on a global basis rather than on an across-the-board basis. Uh, but the effects of it are going to be very similar for HUD programs. In effect, they will lock in the deep cuts uh, have, that have already been made and deepen them somewhat uh, over the next eight years. So, um, And just to give you a sense of uh, what this means for the D.C. metro area, and I, I apologize for the, the small size of the, the fonts here, um, there's about, at least as of last year, about 32,000 low-income families using housing choice vouchers in the, the greater D.C. metro area, and that doesn't even count um, the vouchers that come from state agencies uh, that might be used in this area. Um, Due to sequestration alone, we, we would expect about 2,000 of those vouchers to be lost uh, by 2014 sometime, a pretty substantial uh, reduction in assistance. Uh, this chart shows what the sequestration cuts mean for, for major core HUD programs, vouchers, public housing, homes, so on. Um, the money is pretty big, almost a billion dollars just for vouchers alone. Uh, but the other point I want to make here is that for 
many of these programs, particularly for public housing, for the big block grants, the home program, CDBG, uh, as well as for the elderly housing and, and housing for people with disabilities programs, uh, sequestration is just yet another cut on top of very deep cuts that have uh, been made since 2010. And, and we put up a column of numbers showing funding levels in, in 2010 to make that clear here. Okay. So, uh, very quickly, what to do. Um, first of all, uh, it's, it's essential, and this goes back to the challenge that I talked about at the very beginning here. Uh, right now, reporters around the country don't see sequestration as being a big problem. Sure, there's been some headlines about FAA, FAA and, and delays in airports and, and, and so on, but f for the large share of the federal budget, it's not really seen as a problem in the, in the public realm at the level of media. There are also members of Congress who don't believe it's a, a significant problem. And as a result, it's critical that in coming months we document, and not only document, but publicize the real harm to low-income families and communities uh, that, that are resulting from sequestration. If we can't do that, uh, it will be virtually impossible to persuade Congress uh, to reverse these cuts. Uh, and when I talk about publicize and bringing this message to Congress, uh, it, it can't just be the usual suspects, uh, housing authorities, tenant groups, and so on. It, it has to be other uh, major players in the community who care about affordable housing, who have a stake uh, in the, the sustenance of, of Section 8 housing or, or whatever. Uh, that means private owners, that means developers, and, and so on. Uh, second, uh, housing authorities are facing very difficult decisions this year about how to deal with the shortfalls in funding that they're facing. Um, and I just want to make a pitch that uh, what will be an inherently difficult process can be made much easier if all the stakeholders and communities, including residents and advocates, uh, private owners who may rent units to, to Section 8 tenants and so on, as well as housing authorities, are engaged together in frank discussions about the policy options uh, that exist to deal with these shortfalls. Uh, those kinds of open, frank discussions where er everyone is clear about what the real problem is and what the cause of it is and what the the, the potential uh, steps to address it are uh, in the places where that's done, the outcomes tend to be much better for, for residents as, as well as communities and actually for housing authorities too. This has a way of reducing the, the political uh, tension that, that, that exists. Um, in addition, on the legislative front, uh, now, you know, the next opportunity to undo sequestration will probably take place sometime late this summer, or early this fall. Uh, Congress is going to have to act to raise the federal debt limit. Um, that, that action will be accompanied by some package of budget or deficit reduction uh, measures. Uh, that's clearly a major opportunity to make changes to sequestration. Uh, it, it, it looks like that, the debt limit, uh, decision will bump up against, as well, the decision to uh, fund the federal government for fiscal year 2014, which Congress has to do by October 1st. So that, too, may be uh, a vehicle for, for changing sequestration. Uh, in any case, when we make the push to undo sequestration, uh, it's, 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 it's essential that we push for the right solution. Um, flexibility, so-called flexibility to move money around, that may work for FAA, that will not work for HUD programs. There's not, you know, some slush fund inside uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development where you can draw money from to fill shortfalls in public housing and the voucher program uh, to avoid deep cuts in, in assistance to low-income families. That, that's just not going to solve the problem at all. Uh, so uh, the right solution is to cancel sequestration, of course, and to replace it with some alternative measures 
uh, it would all, it would, these measures would almost certainly have to reduce the, the projected deficits by a sig significant amount. But they ought to be measures that uh, do not uh, inflict hardship and increase homelessness uh, for low-income families. Um, and finally, I'll just uh, mention a, a few things that, that Jonathan uh, also highlighted. Uh, in a time like this when uh, the budget this year is incredibly tight and it's likely to remain tight for at least several years into the future, uh, it's, it's even more important than usual to look at other opportunities outside of the appropriations process. And, and two in, in particular, uh, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, tax reform as well as reform of the housing finance system are likely to be on the congressional agenda uh, this year and next year. Uh, in each of those discussions, there are opportunities to expand uh, rental assistance for low-income families uh, to, as Jonathan put it, rebalance uh, federal housing policy uh, in, in important ways. And I can talk more about that in detail if folks are interested. Uh, in addition, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's more important than ever to pursue reforms to HUD programs to make them more cost effective, to reduce administrative burdens for housing authorities, uh, and to improve outcomes for low-income families. For several years now, there have been discussions in Congress about major reform to the rental major uh, HUD rental assistance programs. Uh, there have been different names attached to this, the Section 8 Voucher Reform Act, the Affordable Housing and Self-Sufficiency uh, Act. Um, Last year, a subcommittee in the House reported out legislation, uh, the, the Affordable Housing and Self-Sufficiency Act. Um, that bill uh, includes a core of provisions that would streamline programs, reduce administrative burdens for housing authorities, basically make very scarce federal dollars go a lot further uh, in these programs. There's broad consensus among stakeholders about uh, these core provisions, and this is, as Jonathan said, this is something that we really need to get done. Right now, because this bill has not been enacted, we're leaving, uh, as Jonathan said, more than $500 million a year on the table that could be uh, secured for HUD programs through, through streamlining and, and reform. So uh, that's important too. So uh, with that, I'm going to introduce our, our distinguished panel here. Um, we have four housing authority directors, Eric Brown, who's the director of uh, the PG County um, Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, my home county. Uh, Paula Sampson, who's director of the Fairfax County uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. Stacy Spann, the executive director of the Housing Opportunities Commission. Uh, and Adrian Todman, who's the executive director of the DC Housing Authority. I'm sure uh, all of you know all of these panelists very well. And I think we decided we're gonna start with Eric. Oh, really? <laughs> um, good morning. Good morning. I think, is this thing on? Yep, it's on. Okay, good, thank you. Good morning, uh, again. I, uh, I'd like to do um, a couple of things. Uh, as part of my presentation, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about uh, the Housing Authority of Prince George's County. I'd like to follow that up with just giving you a general idea uh, the impact of uh, sequestration on the Housing Choice Voucher Program and then the Low Income uh, uh, Public Housing Program. And then at the end, I'd like to take a personal liberty and just editorialize uh, a moment about uh, sequestration and, and then a couple of comments that were made earlier. First, the Housing Authority of uh, Prince George's County is what you might describe as a small, medium-sized agency. Um, the largest program that we have is the Housing Choice Voucher Program, in which we have uh, authorization for approximately 5,800 uh, vouchers. Uh, we have a staff of slightly under 100 and between the Housing Authority and the Public Housing Program and the Housing Choice Voucher Program, a budget of approximately uh, $95 million, not a lot of money. But be even before sequestration, we have to start there first. 
Public housing agencies throughout the country say we need $100 to operate. And even before I get the $100, I'm told that, well, you don't have $100, you now have $88.90, and then that subsequently dropped uh, below that. So when you start there, uh, you have to look at uh, specifically the kinds of things you can do to make your agency continue to do the things you do every day to serve uh, low and moderate income families and to maintain and preserve uh, affordable housing in your community. So from our perspective, sequestration and, an, and a combination of other things, <clears throat> here's some of the things we ha we've, we've done just to, just to make sure that we can stay in the game. The first thing was we looked at what vouchers we had on the street that had not already been leased up. And for those vouchers that had not been leased up, we had to tell those particular families, sorry, you have a voucher, you were out looking uh, to try to find a place for you know, your family, your, a new school for your child, and now that's not possible because we have a, a challenge in something called sequestration, which many of them do not understand. So having taken care of that, the other thing that we looked at is that any vouchers that had not been issued, you know, basically we took care of that. Uh, the next thing we looked at is that typically we get a number of families. I remember there was a family who said that they wanted to transfer to another jurisdiction because their child was in this other jurisdiction and it was in Virginia. Uh, the, there was a, a need for her to be close to her child uh, and to be able to have them in a better school. Because, so I had to tell, our staff had to tell this particular family, well, no, because that jurisdiction has a payment standard that's higher than ours, you cannot do that. So that's a real impact on a particular family uh, because of sequestration. The other thing that we fr frequently get is that there are people in other jurisdictions who say, well, we have a family living in your jurisdiction. Will your agency uh, be able to absorb this particular family into your program? Uh, this is something that typically takes place throughout the country between different housing authorities, and if they have the capacity to do so, not a problem. That now is no longer, I know from our standpoint, and I'm sure from other jurisdictions as well, is that we are no longer absorbing uh, others into our program because we don't, do not have the capacity to be able to do so. But the real impact, I think, comes when you look at the vacancies that you have in your agency that you're not able to fill and understand that in the housing choice voucher program, you have to get vouchers leased in order to eat. That means that if you don't earn it, if you don't issue a voucher, you don't earn an administrative fee, and if you don't have the staff to issue the vouchers, then you can't make the administrative fee. So that becomes cyclical for, for us and a number of other agencies. But sequestration said, well, you need to look at it. Can you really afford the staff that you have? The answer to that is no, so you have to make those particular cuts to make the program work. So those are the th type of things that we have done in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. The Public Housing Program is another, is, is, is very similar but somewhat different. The operating subsidy that we get is never enough in any housing authority to take care of the general operation plus the capital improvements that's, that's needed. So if you add sequestration on top of that, then it becomes much more challenging. And here's some of the things that we have to be able to look at in a realistic sense on a day-to-day -day basis. First, I know I don't have enough funds to be able to do the things I need to do on a daily basis, so what gets cut? Does the grass get cut when it grows high and now is the time of the year where the grass is getting cut? The curb appeal is gonna suffer somewhat. So instead of cutting the grass every 10 days, I may have to cut the grass every 15 days, okay? The other thing is do I paint a unit and change all of the filters? And that becomes a challenge in terms of just doing day-to-day -day kinds of operation. 
vacancies do not get filled. And then the real kicker is that there's a backlog of capital improvements because of deferred maintenance over a number of years because the money wasn't there in the beginning. So those deferred maintenance goes out even longer. In our particular agency, we have properties that are more than 40 years old, and they're beginning to show the time, uh, their, their age. Uh, recently, we had a number of, um, of water and sewer lines to collapse. But those are the kinds of things that you, na you naturally have to take care of to safeguard the safety of all of the families to make sure that they're safe. But then in the end, something else suffered because of uh, sequestration and, and, and other things. Um, unit turnaround, how quickly you're going to be able to put units back into service also may be a little bit slower because you may not have the money to be able to take care of all of the units because the units in some cases have been sitting for a while so it's gonna take more to turn those units around. So that becomes problematic uh, for, for us. Uh, so I've talked about the impact on the Housing Choice Voucher Program. I've talked about the impact on the low income um, public housing program. Let me editorialize for a moment. One of the questions posed was whether or not you can deal with sequestration, I believe, um, just by attrition alone. And this is as it relates to the Housing Choice Voucher Program. And when you look at our agency where we have basically l less than one person leaving, one voucher being turned in on an average a month. So over the course of a year, that's 12 vouchers out of 5,800. So can I do it by attrition alone? The answer to that is no. The lesson that I think for me, our agency, as well as other agencies, while sequestration is not good, I think it does force us, my agency and other agencies across the country, is to start looking at the business model that you have. And I have been a long, a long time proponent of housing authorities in particular need to start changing the model that you, that you, that you, you can't totally depend on the subsidy that you're getting from the federal government. So what's the best model for your agency? And, and I think that that's where we are now. That's where our agency is now. And I think that if nothing else, sequestration has taught us we need to move faster along that line of moving away from the business model that we have. I, I mean, I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> More bad news. Um, well, the first thing I'd say is, is, I think it's good morning still. So good morning. And um, I'd like to give a special hello to our commissioners and former commissioners who are here from uh, Housing Opportunities Commission. And of course, um, I think the vast majority of folks are either working with us in some way or um, have worked with us. And so uh, good morning and thank you to all of you. Uh, Really, Eric, I don't, know how, I don't know what to say to that except that um, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it, the sequester itself has forced uh, continued difficult decisions. And I saw, uh, I noted that one of the slides read that since 2010, we've had um, cuts in entitlement programs. And you know, the reality is that the entitlement programs have been under um, scrutiny, uh, I think, since long before 2010. You know, we're, we're, you know, you gotta take it back to 2004 when we really started to see um, significant cuts and follow on uh, consequences uh, as a result of those cuts. And that's across the board. That's housing choice voucher, that's public housing. Um, and there's been this outcry, at least for the past two decades, about what are we going to do with public housing. Um, and, it, you know, that strife, those conversations forced a great deal of innovation. And you saw uh, Hope Six, you saw um, in, some, in some ways uh, uh, moving to work. And I say in some ways because everyone has not, every agency has not been eligible to uh, enact that level of flexibility. Uh, and so for our representatives at, at HUD, uh, we at Montgomery County at HOC certainly would like 
uh, to be treated as a moving to work organization. Um, and so you know, all that said, these issues have been bubbling up for some time. And, and so now we're at a, a real crossroads where the sequester uh, has made it a little worse in some ways and in others a lot worse. And so at HOC, we've had to make some incredibly difficult choices. And, and those choices have effect, affected our staff. And we've, had to, we've actually had to look inward um, and be extremely deliberate um, and careful not to make cuts that are going to have a long-lasting, uh, deleterious mm -hmm. effect on our clients. Uh, and of course, every cut has some mm -hmm. effect on our clients. So which then make the, the, the least impactful um, changes to a client's life? Uh, and then we've had to pass on, mm -hmm. unfortunately, some of these cuts to our clients. And we've, we've now changed our um, occupancy standards. You know, the fair market rents are, are, are moving downward in a jurisdiction that, that frankly, you know, has a pretty high average rent cost. Um, the average housing choice voucher family uh, makes around $16,000 in Montgomery County. You know, we're talking about folks who are, uh, you know, precariously housed, the sequester, these changes, make them more precariously housed. Um, and, and so what do we do about that? What do we do about that? And yes, you're absolutely right, Dr. Rice, in that we've got to um, request, demand, work together, and, and, and try to figure out how we make budgetary change. But in, in the backdrop of all that, we still got to operate. Right? So, so day to day, we're now examining our business model from top to bottom and we're making every possible change so that we manage down overhead as responsibly as we can, but as quickly as we can, uh, and, and still try to meet the greatest need possible. Um, so Montgomery County is about 500, just shy of 500 square miles. Mm -hmm. that's, our, that's our service area. And um, you know, we are authorized to serve in the neighborhood of 6,500 vouchers, but practically we have been serving um, about 5,800, a little over that, 5,800 families. Why? Well, the, the sheer cost of rental housing has, you know, we, we had adjusted our fair market rents up mm -hmm. so that we, you know, those families could in fact live in communities uh, where the housing was indistinguishable from, from, you know, that of market rate families. Um, and then the bottom line is the sheer rental cost is just significantly higher. So what to do? Uh, um, after scratching my bald head uh, and, and having really some hard conversations with our commissioners and, and the staff, uh, and, and frankly, our co my colleagues, you know, the, the choice is, is not that simple, right? It's, it comes down to a couple things. We have to pass on unfortunately, some of the cost to um, our clients. We have no choice but to look inward and reduce overhead, and that is a direct, um, the direct result of that is fewer jobs. And, and then finally, for the long term, we have got to completely retool our business model. That's it. It's, it's you know, it is sobering, to say the least. I mean, it is, it is that nice slap, of, slap in the face of cold water. And, um, you know, the real impact of the sequester on us uh, this year, you know, for Housing Choice Voucher alone is somewhere between five and six million dollars in, in HAP payment. And, you know, half a million dollars reduction in administrative fees. And again, this is this year. This is this coming fiscal year. So we'll have an additional cut next year if the sequester survives. For public housing, you know, already a program that frankly does not make financial sense. Uh, we're talking about a one to one and a half million dollar reduction in operating subsidies. You know, 250 to 300,000 reduction in the capital fund, and that is that 
that, that backlog uh, for, um, for, for maintenance and repair. It's vital to, to making sure uh, this, this important housing uh, can, can continue to endure and operate. So um, <laughs> I don't know, I wish I had better news, folks. Um, I think on, on the other note, we'll be looking to our partners more actively and trying to engage with them in our efforts to continue to provide high quality, amenity rich, hopefully energy efficient um, housing that, that is more financially sustainable. So, Ms. Todd. Me. Okay. I have a PowerPoint, so I need to use the uh, lectern, I'm told. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting us over the river. Uh, some of us came from Virginia this morning and uh, crossed over the Conrad Egan Bridge. Uh, I don't know if you know that we're, we're renaming it Conrad, um, <clears throat> or it should be named that. Um, in, uh, this is a very wonderful event. I'm impressed that it's gone on for 22 years, and uh, I. I know some in the room, and I hope to get to know others. Um, and sometimes uh, we're a little competitive across in Fairfax County. Uh, we like to think we do it right. Um, but we uh, have to admit we are envious of our neighbors in Montgomery and the rest of, of Maryland. You have a, a real, I think, um, proactive approach to affordable housing. You've had a long history of champion affordable housing, you have resources, and, um, and we, we do admire you and we appreciate uh, being your partner. I'm going to walk through, I, I think that uh, my, my <coughs> panelists, my co-panelists have really told the story very well. So some of the things um, I'm going to say uh, actually are very similar. We're all kind of in the same boat. And uh, this is a, a descriptor of where we are in Fairfax County. Let's see, I have to do this. Uh, a little bit of information about Fairfax. We're organized uh, slightly different than uh, most housing authorities. Uh, we have a housing authority, it's called the Fairfax County Redevelopment and Housing Authority, FCRHA. But in Fairfax, we are totally integrated as part of county government. So I have the Department of Housing, and the Department of Housing is a county agency. But that county agency is staff to the FCRHA. So you can see there is a constant uh, inter integration, <coughs> excuse me, bet between the two. <coughs> Uh, we have uh, 35, 37 vouchers, uh, less than Montgomery or Prince George's County. We're a mid-sized uh, housing authority as well. Uh, our average income is closer to 20,000 a year, and 70% of those uh, receiving vouchers are families. Uh, we, we calculated that about 4,000 children uh, really live in families that depend on a voucher to, uh, to, to uh, have a roof over their head. So this is an important point, which I think is something that we really do need to drive home. Uh, we have had lots of conversations about sequestration uh, in Fairfax recently, and this resonates, the fact that there are kids. And sometimes we forget that. We talk in units and numbers and dollars. And, uh, but the fact that there are children is really, I, I think, is uh, something that we really do need to get that message out as well. They're being affected. In fact, the average family under the voucher program in Fairfax, probably not unlike others, um, is a single mom with two kids. And uh, in Fairfax, she's paying about $445 dollars of her income toward, uh, toward rent. Also in Fairfax, we are a really hugely involved in a partnership with our program. So it's not simply the housing authority providing vouchers, but the a whole a planned and homelessness is really dependent on vouchers being available. 
We work with our Community Services Board, which is our mental health agency, and they are dependent uh, on our programs to house, the, house their clients. And of course, our nonprofit partners. So it's a, it's a real collaboration, and when uh, the pinch is with, on the authority, the pinch is on everyone in the community. <clears throat> our status right now is the good news is we're 99% leased. The bad news is we're 99% leased. Uh, we have long waiting lists. We do give preferences for the homeless, the elderly, uh, those with disabilities. Uh, the, the reality, though, is the only way you're going to get a voucher is turnover. And uh, we've had an average of about 15 turnovers a month. Uh, we are using a planning factor of about 10. And in March, it was seven. So you can see that um, they, the, the turnover, even though it's really where you get your voucher, there are no new vouchers, um, there's really not a lot of turnover. Sequestration makes that even worse. Uh, you know, we're still lots of unknowns. We're, we're doing lots of projections. We're making our best guess. Uh, but, but we don't know. We, we do not have our, uh, after post-sequestration uh, calendar year 13 funding from HUD yet. And so, uh, so we don't know exactly what the cuts will look like. We don't know if HUD will take an offset. We happen to be a housing authority that has pretty healthy reserves. Uh, we don't know, uh, we do know that we will have to use those reserves to address sequestration, but we don't know how much uh, HUD might um, take off the top uh, in terms of an offset. We know that HUD has announced there'll be a set aside uh, for those who have to terminate vouchers. So we do not know if we would qualify. We certainly are going to try to get some of that funding, but the, the question marks are out there. Um, we just know that we have to plan now because we do not want to end the year um, in a deficit. We can't. And uh, it, we have to address the immediate crisis. And we know, most likely, we will be a smaller program in the future. So what you've heard about restructuring your model, that's true for us as well. Um, we are fortunate that we were just designated as a moving to work agency. And that's going to give us, we believe, a lot of new tools in order to address uh, some of these challenges, so that we have one small bright light uh, in our situation. The Housing Authority is trying to uh, address the situation. Again, many moving targets. We're kind of looking at it as a worst case right now. Um, we're working with the Authority to look at all the different options that might be available. Um, some have, are more impactful than, than others. Um, all of them, however, are painful. Uh, we're working with our nonprofit partners. We've brought them to the table, and that has been really um, a very important step. Uh, rather than working in isolation, they have really stepped up. Once they understood the problem, it took a little while to understand the problem because we were taking away vouchers from their clients. But once they understood the, the reason behind it, they have become advocates. And they can get out there and tell the story, I think, far better than uh, we as staff can. Uh, our principle is that uh, overarching everything else, we were going to try to protect those who have a voucher from having to lose their voucher. Um, and we wanted to maintain at least a one-week reserve. We felt that was um, fiscally prudent and something we wanted to, uh, to, to try to do. Um, very simply, this is way oversimplified, but it kind of shows the picture we're facing that we, after sequestration, we'll have funding for about 3,200 vouchers. Our, we're leased up right now, though, at 3,500. So you can see right there, we have a problem. Uh, we will have, we will, same attrition, nobody gets a new voucher. We froze those as, as of April 1st. Uh, so that will reduce the number to about 3,400. Uh, but we still have 200 that are at risk for termination if something else doesn't happen. Uh, freezing attrition is just not enough. Uh, so as I mentioned, we, we are using a planning factor of 10, 10 per month. 
And we have to look at this both for the immediate and the long term. Uh, we've rescinded vouchers. Those folks, you've heard their story already from Eric that who were on the street looking for a place in a very tight rental market, so, so it's tough to find a place. Um, and they thought they won the lottery, and here we took it away. So uh, there were 54 in, in that category. Um, we had, uh, uh, we like to project-base uh, a portion of our vouchers, and we tie it to our planned end homelessness and what we call our housing blueprint. We had planned to award 90. We had a competition. We made the announcement. And then we had to cancel, uh, cancel that award because we simply knew there would not be new tenant-based vouchers to hand out. Uh, we have no new leasing. That is frozen. And, um, but we still uh, anticipate uh, significant termination. I mentioned the blueprint. This is, this is a, a very successful approach we took to a, small, a pie that was getting smaller and smaller over the last couple years where we took all the goals, it includes from homelessness to those with special needs, to working families, to workforce and home ownership. And it's all represented in goals and metrics on the blueprint. And we basically put all our resources on the table. And we said, all right, here's what we've got. Let's work together to prioritize and divide it up. And it has been our, our guiding force um, for probably three years now. Uh, unfortunately, though, we know that sequestration uh, is going to blow it up, if not put it in reverse. So we're very alarmed uh, by what this could mean to our blueprint, but still committed that even in sequestration, we're going to retool it and come back and try to continue to make this work uh, because it's, it really does help everyone to, to feel that they've got a piece of the pie. Uh, termination is uh, the most troubling if we have to terminate 168 to 200 families. Uh, there could be 400 children uh, that would be homeless. Uh, definitely the impact is on the poor, the disabled, the elderly, because they're the ones really using uh, our vouchers to the greatest extent. And how on earth will we decide who to terminate? That's a question uh, we, we haven't even attempted to struggle with yet, but we know it's out there. Uh, we're hoping that we might be able to benefit from the HUD set aside, uh, but we don't know the answer to that yet. So we have taken an approach. Uh, we've met with the Housing Authority. We met last week, or was it this week? Can't remember. Um, with the Board of Supervisors, and uh, we talked about options. And option A is basically let it happen, uh, and probably what's going to happen is we will have to terminate 168 to 200 individuals, uh, no new leasing, uh, but it will get us to where we need by the end of December. Option B was really to change our occupancy standard. It doesn't look like HUD is going to approve um, any, any waivers on that. Uh, and I do understand that some uh, of our neighboring housing authorities have already done that. Uh, it's been a long-standing policy in Fairfax, though, that uh, the uh, age and sex of each of the family members um, is accounted for in, uh, in bedrooms. So a single mom with one child would receive two bedrooms and a two-bedroom voucher. But um, if we were to make a change, that, uh, the, the payment would be more like for a one-bedroom and let her work it out. So uh, it's very disrupting to the family and doesn't actually solve the problem either because we still would have some termination. Um, we, we are looking at other approaches. Should families pay more? Right now they pay 30%. Could we up that to 35%? Uh, again, HUD, I don't believe HUD will give us the authority to do that in time. We, under moving to work, we will officially become later this fall. Um, we might have the ability to do that. So from a long-range plan, that is something I think we will be looking at. And, uh, and then finally, uh, and the greatest hope for us is, uh, and this is when it's, you know, you're, you really appreciate being in a county like Montgomery or like Fairfax County because our Board of Supervisors is giving us a safety net. And we have a small... Um, Think of it as a, a local housing choice voucher program. It's not really, but it's uh, but it does have funding, 
And uh, the, the feeling is that the board does not want to see people on the street. So they won't act on that until probably fall, but uh, we did present it and, and I think got a, a pretty, pretty good tacit uh, support, at least, from our Board of Supervisors. So that's really my presentation, and I will um, stop there, and, uh, and then I'll participate uh, in other questions and discussions with the other panelists. Thank you. So I suppose that um, there's not much to, to talk to in terms of the, the, the impact. I think we're all going through the same thing. I guess I would say what, what Darwin said um, um, back in the day, that it wasn't the strongest or the most intelligent of the species that survived. There was the most, those that were most able to adapt. And, and certainly if that's the case, um, uh, my peers up here and the other 3,000 across the country are the strongest superhumans um, in terms of being able to be corporate superstars to figure out how do we deal with sequestration. Um, at the DC Housing Authority, we're faced with a million dollars less each month in real time. A million dollars less each month. Most of that is in our voucher funding. Um, we are not going to be able to house 250 homeless families between now and the end of this fiscal year. And we're taking a strong look at our staffing. I, I've, I've not taken any immediate cuts to our staffing yet for a core reason. These are not disposable bureaucrats. These are the folks that when you call us because there's a bad Section 8 neighbor in your neighborhood, or you're really concerned that the, the, the family that you just saw, um, kids, units, toilets not working, who do you think is doing that? I said last week um, at another session that we do not have a core of volunteers who are administering public housing and Section 8 across the country. These are paid people who are trying to make sure that it is very precious resource that we have in this country called public housing is maintained, this very precious resource that we have. That's the voucher program continues to house the many, many seniors and disabled and children. Um, these are not disposable bureaucrats, and I think they're far more important than having to wait another hour in line at the airport. Um, let, me, let me also say that across the country, what we're seeing is strong impacts to some of our clients. Um, housing authorities are being forced to raise rents, and, and you've heard some of that here. But I think what's really dire is the continued disrespect for the work that we do um, right inside the Beltway. To have a capital fund that is the size that it is right now is ridiculous. Um, there's a $26 billion backlog, and I think other Jonathan or Doug referred to that, that grows every single day. Um, um, to, to not fund the capital fund at the rate that it needs to be creates a vicious cycle. If you have a capital fund at the size that it is, if you have an operating subsidy that is 83% of what it should be, or now proposed for 90%, um, which is better than 83% of what it should be, what you begin to do is you, you, you begin to pay for the projects. You're not paying for quality public housing. We don't like to refer to our, our, our portfolio these days as the projects. We say, no, we're developments. We're trying to raise the bar. We're trying to actually reverse a recent survey, the Rethink survey, that looked at perceptions of public housing that was recently done that's found that 63% of folks do not want public housing next to them. Um, the vicious cycle continues. If you don't give us the money so that it looks like public housing, it doesn't look like the projects, then people don't like our stuff, then it's not politically important, then we get less funding. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So what I ask of all of you here today is to be outraged, be upset, because what will happen if we can't house families, the families don't disappear. They don't vanish into where did they go kingdom. They're on the streets. They're in your neighborhoods. They're next to your 7-Elevens and your Starbucks. That's where those families go. If we can't fix our public housing, 
than some of you out there that do business with us, guess what? There is no business. We don't have the money to give out the contracts to rehab. We are, we are constrained in terms of being able to be the entrepreneurs that everybody wants us to be. So be outraged if for your own personal interest, be outraged. But as you are, remember the millions of families that we're serving across the country. Remember the hundreds of thousands of people we're serving just in this area. Be outraged, go home, pick up a phone, call someone and tell them that this has to stop, that you're willing to wait an hour in line if a homeless family can be housed. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for two questions, I've been told. <laughs> who is it who wants to ask a question most badly? more of a comment than a, a question. Um, yeah, that'd be a great idea if every member of Congress was required to live in, in public housing or with a Section 8 voucher for some time before being allowed to vote on funding for these programs, for example. Other questions? Great panel, and thank, thank you very much, uh, particularly Adrian, for those comments because they really do, I think, resonate with a lot of us who work here in housing. My question is, given the, the vast amount of private sector real estate development that's going on right now, and um, when you look at the units that are coming online, most of them meeting an income requirement that's a lot higher than the folks that you serve. Can any of you kind of comment on what kinds of possible partnerships or initiatives that can be done with the private sector to help make the housing authorities be a little more efficient and nimble and definitely narrow the delta that they have with regards to the demand for uh, affordable units? Uh, well, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so at HOC, it's more than just you know the typical public housing authority. Um, it also is a housing finance agency and has a robust pipeline of mixed income developments in, in its portfolio. And that is, um, you know, it's, it, it's been deliberate since uh, HOC's inception. The commission uh, and executive directors prior to me have been um, deliberate about making sure that that's part of uh, our development program. Uh, so we're, we're um, accustomed to partnering. We're, in fact, in, in virtually every development, looking uh, actively to the private sector, um, to partners, to, in fact, make our developments um, better, again, uh, well-designed, amenity-rich. I mean, you know, those of you who, uh, with whom I've worked, which is almost the whole room, um, you've heard me say it you know, many, many times, um, I, I think that our, our developments, our communities are made better when we're working with our partners. And you know, those partners um, are often private sector folks, but in Montgomery County, it's, it's in fact county government mm -hmm. as well. I mean, the, you know, um, it's you know, the county executive, his team, Rick Nelson, his team, they are um, you know, really attached to the hip uh, to, to HOC in, in our development efforts. Mm -hmm. And that's a unique, I, you know, I grant you, that's a unique partnership, uh, but it's something that we're continuing um, to, to move forth. Now, in terms of making ourselves more efficient, you know, we're taking many cues from uh, the private sector. We happen to work with third-party management companies, property management companies, and the benefit of that is, you know, we actually get to look over their shoulder. So any innovations that those folks are uh, enacting in their own businesses, we're able to examine and, and frankly, uh, modify for our own use. 
and I'd say that uh, across the board. Um, and, and I wanted to echo uh, one of the points of, of, of the, um, the, the prior speaker. You know, affordable housing really does, I mean, there's a connectivity to, to, to jobs, to job growth, to our economic well-being. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's in, just rooted in that is, again, our partnership with the private sector, whether it's general contractors, um, the various subs, subcontractors, um, the development partners, um, the folks who are providing uh, financing for us, the syndicators and, and tax credit investors, county government, and on and on. So we've got a robust history of that, and, and you know, I'm not gonna talk about our entire pipeline, of activity, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you know, I think we'll be knocking on many of your doors. Where's Capital One in here somewhere? Um, <laughs> pretty soon. I think I could also add to that uh, question. In Fairfax, we are, I think, getting very serious and creative about uh, public-private partnerships where we have examples of using county surplus land, land at the county government center where private sector developer is coming in on a ground lease and is building uh, affordable housing. Um, also, the housing authority is looking very closely at its own portfolio. We have some very strategically located properties <clears throat> that are underdeveloped, quite frankly, and we plan to have public-private partnerships and require the developer to have a component of serving extremely low income without any subsidy from us. So bringing the land and the opportunity we feel is, is sufficient. I uh, might just add too that I think there is interest in Congress and, and at HUD in, in this issue. And in fact, um, Congress has uh, authorized a rental assistance demonstration, the goal of which is to allow a a, a very small number of housing authorities to convert their existing public housing funding streams to project-based rental assistance contracts, which would al enable them to more easily raise private capital to, to meet the, the capital needs of, of their developments. And uh, certainly one of the goals there is to, to bring private partners uh, in, into, into these developments and, and with all, all sorts of benefits that come with that. So. So I want to thank Doug Rice and all of our housing, direct, housing authority directors. I invite you back. I want to do a roundtable on this in the fall and see where we were today, are today and where we're going to be in the fall. And I'm going to take a moment right before I send you on your way to the four incredible panels. It is unconscionable that this Congress has given the role of God to play to housing directors. It is unconscionable because they are influencing and impacting the lives of those persons who are most vulnerable. And it not only affects them, as uh, Adrian Todman said, it affects businesses, private sector, nonprofit sector, the government, and our neighbors, all of us. So I urge you in a call to action from the Affordable Housing Conference, contact your members of Congress and urge them to stop this sequestration now. Look in your packets, you will see where your panels are. They're all downstairs and then come back for lunch. We'll have uh, Representative Elijah Cummings, Chris Van Hollen, Ike Leggett, our county council members, uh, Paul Sarbanes, some really wonderful award presentations uh, that we can all look forward to. Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown, who will be with us at lunch and who also has a special announcement coming later today. So it's going to be a, um, a packed lunch. So come up right away uh, after the panels, get your seats, and let's begin our journey and climb those mountaintops together. <laughs>